I'm Dr. Iacobucci uh, from Phoenix. Just uh, a, a minute on my background. I'm coming from a sports medicine background, which um, you can really approach this technology either from sports medicine or from joint replacement. And what you're going to see is it fits really right in the middle of both of those subspecialties. I'm going to discuss the knee this morning. <clears throat> Uh, the first thing on the slide is a description, uh, really, of what arthrosurface is. It's a non-biologic, congruent, inlay resurfacing of the knee. Obviously, it's a lot easier to just say arthrosurface. Um, just to put it into perspective, when we're uh, met with a cartilage defect in the knee joint, we need to understand what will happen if it goes untreated, and it will go on to degenerative joint disease with an enormous uh, cost in lost wages, lost productivity. And so, as orthopedic surgeons, we would like to be able to fix the defect and, in a perfect world, eliminate pain, improve function, and even prevent DJD. So the idea is to have an implant of some type that will fill the defect, that will relieve the stress from the shoulder that surrounds that defect because it's the shoulder that will bear all of the stress, which is far increased from what would normally be there, and that will lead to the breakdown of the shoulder and then diffuse degenerative change in that particular part of the knee. So from that, <clears throat> this field in uh, knee surgery has kind of blossomed in the last 15 to 20 years. And this is the biological approach for repairing articular cartilage. This is also known as cartilage restoration. It's something that I do a lot of. And uh, as you can see, there's different techniques, and they all have a kind of a different fit into the armamentarium, uh, anywhere from simple arthroscopic microfracture all the way up to the large uh, osteochondral allograft, or the big oats procedure. And of course, uh, Cardicel, you're all familiar with, and uh, the autograft oats are kind of in between. So what do we do if we need to fix a defect in a patient who has already had a biological attempt and it has gone on to fail, or in somebody who's too old for biology? And you know, really, as you start getting into the mid to late 40s uh, and older, uh, it's going to be hard to utilize biological potential. The vascularity is not as good. The cells are older, uh, and other uh, senescent changes have started to take hold. So you may have to look beyond biology in those patients and there is kind of the niche that I see uh, Arthrosurface has, has filled. So back in 2004, Arthrosurface started their FDA clinical trials, and uh, that was actually with an implant that we don't have uh, in our trays here in the U.S. This is the implant that uh, was already being used in Europe. It's the round uh, and called the Hemicap, and this will be confusing because the system we're using in the U.S. today, it's, it's called the Unicap. Uh, and it's not round, but suffice it to say, that's where the original FDA studies began uh, in 04. In 2008, Arthrosurface um, then was made available as technology here in the U.S. for articular cartilage focal lesion repair. And what this has done, <clears throat> it's filled in a niche in the armamentarium for cartilage defect repair. As I was saying, in the younger patients, you can rely more on biology which would be uh, utilizing their cells, whether it's through microfracture, uh, bringing out the marrow cells or cardicel, um, bringing their actual chondrocytes back into the joint after they've been manipulated. So under 30, you know, I like for a focal defect of, of um, a significant size, one of these two. When you start getting into 30, and four, 30 to 40, maybe they've already had one of these two procedures. Then you start looking at grafting as opposed to growing. You can either use their tissue or you can go to cadaver tissue for that. As you start getting beyond that into the over 40 crowd uh, up to say 55, and these are certainly ballpark numbers only, then you start thinking about this void that used to exist. And we used to tell patients, you know, you're probably a candidate for a knee replacement but you're too young. And they would just leave the office with this empty look on their face like, well, okay, what am I going to do now? I'm 45 years old. My knee hurts. Um, you know, you can do cortisone shots, bracing, you can do therapy, you can do visco supplements, but you're going to get limited uh, benefit from that. So I think that's kind of the niche where we see arthrosurface fitting in. And then on beyond that, you get into the over 50 with the more diffuse one compartment degeneration. Now you're beyond the focal defect and you're into a diffuse pattern in, in a specific compartment 
where you can do a uni, <clears throat> and these are gaining in popularity uh, in the last 10 years. And, uh, and then, of course, beyond that, when it becomes a global disease, there's the total knee replacement. It, if you look at uh, the different size, defect sizes, and where these biological uh, treatments have been uh, utilized in the past with, with reasonable results, you'll see that arthrosurface kind of fits right in the middle. And these are the different dimensions on the uh, implants. And you have here on the uh, top left the unicap, uh, smaller unicap, and this is the femoral condylar implant. You can see that would give you roughly four square centimeters of coverage. And, and then the, tr more the, the initial unicap um, gives you all the way up to eight square centimeters. So these are your two femoral condylar implants, and they take you from that four to eight square centimeter range of coverage. And then here in the trochlear implants, you know, you're down in the four again with the original one. That was the first uh, called the hemicap. And then in the more later design, the larger one, gets you all the way up uh, e even beyond nine square centimeters. This one here is more for uh, resurfacing the entire trochlea. <clears throat> and we'll, we should be able to look at all of those today in the lab. So why use a focal defect implant instead of a uni or a total? Well, what you gain by staying uh, and just fixing the problem uh, and not throwing away the rest of the joint, obviously you maintain normal anatomy, joint line, contour, tissue tension, better function, um, or more normal function and higher activity goals should be what you can achieve and certainly in younger patients you would want to preserve more tissue and that's what you do with this system. It's an inlay as opposed to many of the other arthroplasty sets. Uh, you're not putting an implant on the affected surface, you're actually setting it into the surface, you're putting it in the defect. So ideally, you'd want it recessed uh, approximately a millimeter from the surrounding articular surface, and that's uh, what the measuring devices and reamers will um, accomplish for you. It's bone sparing, uh, so therefore easier to revise to a more traditional arthroplasty. Uh, you really don't burn bridges um, when you're preparing the bone for these implants. It's meniscal sparing, ligament sparing. The remainder of the articular surface is spared and you're really matching the implant to the patient's anatomy. And I put in red down at the bottom, intraoperative surface mapping. That's really the key to arthrosurface. It's the technology that has allowed this system to do what it can do. By fitting uh, whatever surface you need to treat, by fitting whatever size defect you need to treat, um, you accomplish that in the operating room and you do it with specific measurements using their guides and that sets this system apart. These are the, the t uh, first femoral condylar implants released in the U.S., uh, the, the unicap implant, and that's the 20 by 40 size, and it's um, the same components, uh, materials that are used in total knees. And then for down on the tibia, there's just a small button that is actually inserted arthroscopically, and it's uh, high molecular weight polyethylene. So that's kind of where it all started uh, here in the U.S. is with those implants. The requirements for this technology are, are basically the same as for the biological repairs. So by that I mean you need normal alignment or very near normal. You need a good meniscal function. There's no study that says, you know, it has to be greater than 50 percent or it has to be greater than 80 percent meniscal function. But uh, I think as, as my general rule, I like to know that most of that meniscus is still in there and still functioning. And if it's not, we're probably beyond what arthrosurface can do and we should think about a uni uh, in that compartment. And you also need a stable joint. The tibial uh, replacement is really um, not done that often. Most of the time, these patients will have uh, adequate meniscal tissue and uh, adequate uh, tibial articular cartilage, whereby you can uh, just do the femoral implant and uh, achieve a um, good result. But this is an arthroscopic, this is the only implant in the system that is uh, carried out arthroscopically. And it's really a lot like doing an ACL reconstruction, um, using the arthroscopic guide, drilling a, a little uh, tunnel, and then you use a, a retrograde reamer. This blade fits on the tip of the pin and you pull it downward and so you create arthroscopically a, a little socket that has the right, obviously the right location, the right size, and then you trial it 
And the last thing you're going to do is you're going to um, inject cement. This is kind of nifty. You'll inject cement up the tunnel while you're holding the little poly button down and uh, retrograde your cement. So it goes in under pressure, and as you fill the tunnel, you back that out, and then you're done. So not very often uh, is that done anymore, but it's out there, and if you need some tibial coverage and if it's a, a, the right uh, indications are met, that's how you accomplish it with this system. Now here's the femoral one. This is obviously the one that's going to be a lot more popular. And um, as in all of the arthrosurface implants, uh, you'll see that you have to first get a guide pin situated in the center of the defect that you're repairing, and it needs to be perpendicular to the surrounding bone. And uh, this little guide here is going to accomplish that. It has little foot um, points that will sit around the, the defect. And you'll fire your pin perpendicular. And then you'll start with these measurements. And this is what I was saying about intraoperative surface mapping. All of these implants require that you go through these steps to measure out you know, what is the height of the surrounding bone, medial and lateral, and then what is the height of the surrounding bone, proximal and distal. So you get these four poles, uh, more or less north, south, east, and west. And those measurements are going to be taken uh, during the surgery uh, to determine. For instance, the, the east-west or the medial lateral measurements are used to determine the depth of the central ream for this femoral implant. And then the north-south measurements or the proximal distal measurements or superior inferior measurements are used to determine which guide you're going to set on here which will determine the angle of the top and bottom pin and the angle of the top and bottom ream. So basically what you're doing with intraoperative mapping is you're measuring out how deep you need to ream and what curvature, what radius of curvature you need to match with your preparation bed. And all of these implants are going to follow that same basic rule. You'll see different guides, different measuring uh, devices, but those two principles are the same. You're looking at the depth of the bed and you're looking at the curvature of the bed. You, you put in your tapered post and that's the, the um, Morris tapered post. It's threaded. It's titanium. And that'll sit right in the center. Let's see if I, yeah. So that'll sit right in that little hole there. And then at the end, the last step, you'll put a little bit of cement, uh, methacrylate cement, behind your implant and snap it onto that tapered post. So you really have two forms of fixation there, uh, cement and um, the more is tapered to the post. <clears throat> and that's, that's it implanted, in a, obviously, in a uh, model. But um, there you have it. And you can even see that that's your little polytibia sitting down there, which you can use if necessary. But you can treat a large grade 4 femoral condylar defect, even with some bone compromise with osteonecrosis. Um, and as long as there's no joint space narrowing, there's an intact meniscus, the rest of the knee is intact, your alignment is good, your ligaments are good. Again, it's all of the indications that you have to meet. For instance, if you're going to do a cardicel or an oats, you have to meet those same indications for uh, arthrosurface. And this patient, being 50 years old, is too old for microfracture, cardicel, or, or even oats. And that's the niche that you can fill with uh, these implants. This is that smaller one that I was just telling you about. Uh, it's for the little bit smaller femoral defect. It's actually simpler uh, to put in. Uh, it uses simpler mapping tools, and these are the dimensions of it. <coughs> Whereas the other one was 40 by 20, this one is really uh, quite a bit smaller. And so here, just quickly, I'll, I'll show you what this looks like. So th now look at the different tool here. Instead of using a stylus uh, and taking measurements with that, you just take um, a a pre-contoured uh, metal, almost like a wand, and set that on there. And if it matches the surface, you're done. You read the number on that little um, measuring device, and that's it, as opposed to using a stylus and rotating it back and forth. This is, I think, a little easier to use. Uh, and the results of, of this measurement, I think, will be a little more predictable than using a stylus. So I like that better. And then you'll select, based on the top-bottom measurement, you'll select the curvature of the bed that you're going to prepare, and that will translate into which block, this is a cutting block, which block you're going to use. So that block will match the curvature of that femoral condyle. 
you'll fix the block, and then you'll start inserting your, your reaming pins using these little white um, centering devices, and then you'll start your reaming. In this case, um, we're reamed and we're putting in, here's, your, here's how it looks after the three circular reams have been done. Your bed is prepared, and now you're, you, again, you've got your threaded post deep into the bone, and you're snapping on your implant at the end. The depth will be determined by your medial lateral measurement, and uh, it will, by design, put the surface of that implant a millimeter below the surrounding cartilage. So it's variable. It just depends on where you are and what the anatomy of that knee is. So here you are um, putting your implant. There's your post, snapping your implant into place. So some of these steps are just like the bigger one. Uh, but the measuring part is actually, I think, a lot simpler. So, and obviously these are all done uh, open. Now the hemicap, what's now called the hemicap, refers to the patellofemoral part of this. And um, again, the materials are just like you know, total knee. You know, you've got your cobalt chromium and your polyethylene. And now your, the first hemicap was the 20 millimeter diameter um, implants. So these are the smaller ones. So in the patellofemoral, the smaller came first, uh, as opposed to the femoral where the larger came first. The indications are localized patellofemoral arthrosis, tro trochlear or patellar defects. And now with the larger implant, which I'm going to show you, you can even do generalized PF arthrosis in a patient who's young enough, who has an otherwise normal knee. Or you can do just isolated trochlear disease, which is very common in the over uh, 40 crowd, particularly the guys have, who've played a lot of running and jumping sports you'll see these defects sitting in the center of the trochlea and the rest of the knee is normal. Some of them have already had chondroplasty or microfracture. This guy's 48. This would be a perfect one, I think, for um, the hemicap trochlea. Uh, it's indicated if you're going to do one surface, you're going to do the other. And I know um, in Europe, oftentimes, they'll do a trochlea and leave the patella alone, but um, that's not recommended. Technically, you should do both sides. You don't want cartilage on metal or cartilage on plastic. So um, let's just talk about this small trochlear implant. This is the first one, the smaller one. And in this case, you actually put the screw in first. This is the only implant that goes down that road. But the first step is actually to put in that threaded Morris taper locking post. And then from that post, you'll do your stylus and take your measurements. And then from those measurements, again, you'll select the depth of the ream uh, that you're going to use and the curvature of the implant that's going to match the anatomy of that surface. So once again, intraoperative surface mapping. This is um, a little bit like engineering, and it's very technical, and it's the part that you really cannot shortcut. If you try to speed up during the measuring part, uh, you'll get burned, and you might make a mistake that you can't correct. So. I would emphasize just take your time and, and rely on your reps. They're going to be there to help you, tell you how to do the measurements and what they mean. And then um, the rest of the case is just really um, you know, a little carpentry with drilling and reaming and pounding, and then you're done. So it's, it's that simple once you get past the measuring. Um, so you've got your post in, and now that you've, you've done your ream, and now you're putting in your final implant, and here it is. Uh, on the patellar side, it's uh, more of the same. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on technique, as I said. But you place your pin, you take your measurements, you make your ream, and then you select your, your trial and then your final implant. And there's your patellar button. The, the thing about the patellar buttons, there's two. If you're going to go in the center, there's an anatomic button that has a, a median eminence running right down the middle of it. If the defect is off center, there's um, just a, a gentle curved patellar button that you can use in that part of the anatomy. So you can select. And this is just an example of a bipolar repair. So this is a person who had, obviously, a, a defect on the patella and the trochlea, 45 years old, grade 4, grade 4, rest of the knee intact, too old for the biology. So you kind of see it's the same story, it's the same niche, and that's where these implants seem to fit in really well. The other thing about this, um, without throwing away the, the cruciate ligaments and without changing the joint line, you can treat defects in multiple compartments with arthrosurface. You can do 
the patella, uh, the trochlea, and one or both condyles, tibial plateau if needed, uh, and um, preserve the, those vital components of that knee. This is one of my first cases. This goes way back to early 09, and this was a 50-year-old nurse. She had already had allograft um, oats plugs put into her femoral condyle medially, and she never stopped hurting. Here's a look at the MRI, and you can see they did not integrate, and they looked very necrotic. Uh, you can even see a little collapse of the subchondral plate there. So, you know, the question is, what do you do? She's 50. Rest of her knee looks pretty good. She's obviously got a little patellofemoral disease, but um, this is when I scoped her. This is January of 09. Big cavity up in the femoral condyle, good meniscus. Tibial plateau looks pretty normal, maybe a little fuzzy, but overall intact. And um, you can see her x-rays, the alignment was good, no loss of joint space. She had a little grade three at the patellar apex. She had some grade three at the central trochlea. I decided not to leave that, you know, in a 50-year-old. That's going to progress. That'll become a source of pain. We've got her implants. We've got her knee open. And so I, uh, I talked to her about possibly doing the patellofemoral as well. This is when the knee is open, and you can see where these plugs were. Everything is just necrotic. So we've got a little cavity to deal with, one, two, three of them. And I found that I had good enough bone for the Morris taper to lock in and filled these with some cement. Uh, and then went up and did the, so there's my femoral uh, unicap, and then I went up and did the patellofemoral joint. And these are some scores that we took on her at five months. She made it back, she's a nurse, she made it back full duty at four months. These are five month post-op changes in her um, knee scores. So she actually did really well. We have a uh, follow-up on her that is uh, approaching uh, four years now. In fact, just past four years, and she's still doing really well. We contacted her on Facebook, believe it or not. But, um, and she's moved out of Arizona. <clears throat> this is another patient that I did, a little different story. He had a cardicel of his medial condyle, a microfracture of his trochlea, 40-year-old golfer, five years post-op, and hurting, medial and anterior. And, you know, I'll try conservative. I may try visco on him. I may try counterforce bracing on him. I want to make sure that they've gone through a little bit of conservative treatment. Uh, and then, uh, you know, then we'll start working them up with MRI and we'll look at our axis and all that and start talking a little bit more about surgical options. But uh, here's his MRI. You can see, if you look carefully, you can see the uh, cartilage repair from the cardicel is, it's rough. And there's, if you look even more carefully, you'll see there's some uh, fluid getting behind the uh, cardicel repair tissue, kind of lifting it up. So that's kind of the, the end game for that one. And here he is, here's the flap of, this is actually what grew from his cardicel repair, and the whole thing's lifting up. Um, meniscus is deficient here. Tibia starting to go a little bit. So I decided on him I would do the, the tibial implant. He's got trochlear disease as well. Um, so this is opened up, looking at the femur, and there's the trochlea. <coughs> trochlea has been fixed, patella tibial button looking through the scope and believe it or not the femoral thing is on there but this is so reflective it almost looks like a condyle this is metal up here you're seeing the reflection from the poly on the tibia so that's arthroscopically at the end uh, what it looked like and uh, this is his x-ray you know when you first see these on a post-op x-ray they really look a little scary but um, You'll, you'll get comfortable with the look. And you'll say, wow, that, that doesn't look like it's in the right place, or I didn't know trochlea had that shape. But that's really how they're supposed to look. He did well at uh, full duty, four months. His scores at six months uh, were, were improved. These are just some of the data that uh, have been generated. Uh, a 24-month follow-up multi-center. These are Womack scores. You can see that there's uh, improvements up to 78% average percent improvement on these scores and these are all the parameters that you would look for in any uh, knee surgery. Here's another uh, follow clinical follow-up multi-center again 43 patients 70 percent of the patients achieved pre-injury level of function and that's patellofemoral data. I've got some patellofemoral data I'll show you at the end of this uh, and, and here's my post-op protocol it's 
it's a little bit of everything kind of thrown in. This is cartilage restoration, a little bit of the ACL protocol, and the nice thing about this, as opposed to the biology repairs, is they bear weight right away. So patients love that. Nobody wants to hear that they're gonna be on crutches for six weeks, particularly when they're trying to hold down a job. That's, that's difficult. So they can bear weight. They can be back to work within maybe a week um, and not even using a cane or a crutch in some cases. You know, younger ones are gonna do a little better. CPM, then therapy, full range of motion, et cetera, labor. Um, Here's a question that I don't know, we don't have the answer to, but you would think if it's an inlay, it'll hold against translational stress better, and maybe these implants will last longer. We don't know, they haven't been out that long, so we could say that. This is the large trochlea, much bigger than that original hemicap. And you're, you're gonna use the same system of intraoperative matching, but you see it almost basically, in a even in a small knee, will cover the entire trochlea, in a big knee, it comes up a little shy, but it's essentially, it's one that you can use for diffuse patellofemoral disease, and it's an implant. Um, so, you can resurface the entire trochlea. These are the dimensions. The other one was 20, so now we're up to 20 by 20. This one's 36 by 35. It's an inlay. Uh, the nice thing about an inlay, particularly in the patellofemoral joint, you won't get this clunking and catching at patellar capture. A lot of the Original patellofemoral arthroplasty uh, implants were met with this problem, and that patella would start finding its way into the proximal trochlea at about 20 degrees flexion. There would be a clunk, and sometimes it would hurt. You won't get that with this, because this is, remember, this is inlaid, and it's a, a millimeter below the surrounding surface, so that patellar um, capture should be much better. Uh, there won't be overstuffing. You shouldn't be tightening the joint by having too much implant material in there because again they're inlaid. So uh, the patellar components have two shapes in the large system, the, either the dome or the sombrero, and they each have their own uh, advantage. The dome gives you a broader contact surface, the sombrero gives you a little bit more capturing uh, or a little bit more medial lateral stability. So you can kind of decide based on what your patient's all about and what, what the knee's like, which one you prefer. This uh, system actually, instead of using the stylus, this system for the large trochlea has uh, metal cards. These are the cards here. And again, I like this. This is a lot easier than, than rotating that little needle around. Uh, you just set the card on there, and the one that fits the surface is the one you select. The numbers are on there. Those are your measurements. And you measure medial to lateral, proximal to distal, or superior to inferior. So select the card and get your numbers, and from that you're gonna select your central ream, the depth of that central ream, and then uh, from the superior inferior, you're gonna select the contour of the guide block. So, for instance, those measurements at the bottom. Here's your central ream, here's your guide block, here's your proximal and distal ream, and um, you get your bed, you put your trial in, you use your trial to put the post in, and then uh, cement in your implant at the end. <coughs> Patella, this is an inlay, otherwise it's very similar to um, any other patellar implant. But being an inlay, you have to match very carefully the perpendicularity once again. So you start out with your little guide, fire your pin, ream your socket, and place your implant with a little cement behind it. And that'll cover pretty much the whole patella, depending on the size of the patient. I accumulated data on my uh, patellofemoral patients, 20 patients, and here's the breakdown, and uh, we saw significant improvement, and our follow-up now is out at 52 months, and we are gonna get this published. We need a little bit more uh, of our minimum follow-up before it'll qualify for some of the big journals. After doing uh, four years of this kind of work with Arthrosurface, I find it to be versatile, reproducible, with favorable results. Uh, no bridges are being burned. Keep this one uh, thing in mind, as with all of our procedures, there are no shortcuts, particularly with the surface mapping. You've got to get those measurements and get them right the first time, because once you ream, uh, in, a, in many cases, and the reps will be there to assist you, once you ream, uh, 
you, you bought it.